foundations of property law and we're into week two of term two of term one uh, 2020. Now this week is unusual in that I'm pro obviously providing you with a pre-recorded session and the reason for that is that I want you to take control of the um, Zoom session scheduled for Wednesday night for yourselves and um, I'll speak more about that shortly. The other thing that you might have noticed is that I've released the second assessment now and um, you can access that through Moodle and I'll go through that with you shortly. So there are some things that I'd expect by now you would have done. I expect that you would have been through the Moodle site and as I encourage you to do with reading a statute where you look at all of the material and then identify specific parts from there rather than simply reading from the top and then going from the, the top to the bottom. Have a look at all of it in a general sense and then in more detail go back and look at those weekly sessions. So you should have at least looked at all of the Moodle site, got a feel for it. You should certainly now have a look at the assessment pieces and worked out a way of uploading your assessments when you get to that stage. For many of you, that'll be second nature by now, of course. I do hope that if you haven't already made contact with fellow students, you would attempt to do that, perhaps form some study groups and what I hope will happen on Wednesday night should encourage you in that regard. And very importantly, given that I want you to look at your end objective and then work back from there, I hope that you've already mapped out your study plan. So this week we're dealing with general concepts of property law and you'll see the prescribed reading, Sackville and Neve, Australian Property Law, Chapter 1, essentially the first half of that chapter, and Cameron Dow, uh, LexisNexis Q&A uh, for Chapter 1 as well. As you read through the material, you'll see there's a, a lot of information and in some ways the material is quite difficult to read. So I need to speak with you about managing your expectations. Last week I mentioned that law students do suffer a considerable amount of stress and that's natural and part of that is because of the information overload that you may potentially feel. So let me make this very clear statement. I don't expect you to know all of the law in this subject and no one knows all of the law in this subject, let alone all of the law generally. As you progress through your legal career, or your legal studies and whatever career you choose, you may be surprised at the number of people that come to you and say something like, as you know, in the context of some legal problem. And the fact is that you may not know. You might have a good idea of the general principles, you might understand, how the law is applied generally, but as for knowing a particular regulation in the traffic regulations, um, the, the Transport Road Use Management Act, for example, in Queensland, well, nobody expects you to know that. So what you need to know is how to interpret the law generally, which means knowing how to access the law and knowing the, the best sites to go. So you'll need to know how to source the law and then have an idea of how to read it and apply it. But don't think that you need to know it. Um, so when you're reading the textbook, don't be too caught up in terms of a lot of the detail. Many of the cases, for example, the High Court decisions are, and I mean this respectfully, not particularly well written in the context of being able to follow the logic in a sequential manner. Technically, it's all very good and it's very important, but it's not like reading a Hemingway novel, novel where it's laid out in a, a really user-friendly style. Legislation, however, can be very good and very instructive and very easy to read. Of course, you know my thoughts on the Property Law Act. I don't like it. It's a missed opportunity as far as I'm concerned. But other pieces of legislation are pretty good. And even some of the older pieces of legislation, like the Sale of Goods Act, which is important for this unit, is generally well written. The Australian Consumer Law 
very well written, for example. Um, one thing that I must stress is that when you're reading the material from your textbook, there seems to me to be a relative absence of reference to primary sources of the law, particularly legislation. Now, given, of course, as you know, that Parliament made law, statute law or legislation, if you'd like to call it that, is the fundamental area of primary law and will override secondary law, um, will override case law and secondary law, then of course it's important that where you can, please refer to legislation. <clears throat> and when you're reading legislation, be aware that you need to consider things like the commencement date of legislation. So it may be that um, in a particular question that you're asked to answer, there is no reference to the dates by which these events have allegedly occurred, or it may be that there are dates which um, require you to consider whether the act was in force at the time or whether certain sections of the act were in force at the time as well. So you need to consider potentially commencement tables and government gazettes, um, and you may need to find the amendment history, and you can do that through legislation Queensland, for example. Don't get too caught up on that, but I want you to, to ensure that you don't commit a, a rookie error by assuming that, for example, um, that an event that occurred in, let's say, 1974 was covered by the Property Law Act because the Act may not have been enacted, or in force rather, at the time of that particular event. I hope you get the idea. Now, of course, when you do look at the legislation, Remember, of course, all of those things that you learnt during statutory interpretation. So when you're interpreting legislation, think about the purpose or the object of the um, Act. Uh, we talked about this last week, the purpose or object provisions, the interpretation provisions, and of course, the um, extrinsic materials. And when you're considering case law, fundamentally, remember that the doctrine of precedent, that courts should, in certain circumstances follow earlier decided cases does apply but remember of course the hierarchy and the higher the court that made the decision within the hierarchy the more authoritative uh, the decision is and um, potentially binding rather than persuasive only all right well i hope that all makes some sense and it's meant to encourage you as much as remind you in many ways Let's have a look at the second assessment. To do that, I'll share the screen. Please bear with me while I find it. You should now be looking at the second assessment. Now, there is a slight discrepancy between that which was, for want of a better term, advertised in the unit profile and that which I have produced. The unit profile recall, recalls, sorry, provides that the second assessment is a quiz. Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by quiz. Um, if it's a series of questions designed to test what you're learning, then the second assessment is a quiz. If you think of a quiz as multiple choice, then this is not a quiz. So um, the second assessment is due on Thursday, the 21st of May, the usual rules apply, 5% deduction per day for each day of late submission. And the last day of submission, if you like the cutoff, is Wednesday, 3 June 2020. I won't accept any work after that day. So clearly, have your work completed and uploaded before the due date, both to avoid late penalties and um, even more significantly, to ensure that you're not blocked out by the system because the system will shut you out if you're late. So what do we want in the second assessment? Well, I, I want a response to three quiz questions. And whenever you're writing something in law, particularly if, uh, if the unit coordinator requires it, as I do, ensure that you have a persuasive, well set out document and do watch the professional um, standard of your writing. 
So I do assess you on spelling, gramming, grammar, syntax. Um, I do want you to write in a professional manner. And even though this is not a specific hint, remember, of course, that whenever you're referring to any piece of law, you need to be mindful of um, practitioners' conduct rules, practice directions, etc., statutes, of course, case law, of course, and academic writing, academic writing being secondary sources. Um, you also need to consider ethical requirements that may be relevant for answering a particular question. Now, I will provide feedback, as you might expect, and usually that's quite detailed. For this second assessment, there's a 2,250 word limit. Well, simply 750 words per question, and there are three questions. Ensure, please, that you reference your work in accordance with the Australian Guide to Legal Citations, fourth edition. If you're not familiar with that, please become familiar and have a working knowledge of it. In this assessment, as always, there is a rubric and please consider that in the context of the answers that you write. And then bear in mind the assessment criteria. Um, and I've just spotted a, uh, an issue which I will change. So the um, final version will be just slightly different to that which you're seeing on the screen. Now, the assessment tasks will be the same. And um, in the assessment task, question one is, 10 marks only, 750 words, and it's a question that goes to a dispute between Jim on the one hand and Cam and Ari on the other. You've probably noticed that um, I try to keep the names of these fictitious parties very simple. Uh, they're not particularly clever names because I don't want you to be caught up with their names. I, really looking for you to answer the legal problem. And um, I use short names generally, particularly in a written examination, so you're not spending any more time than you need to. Anyway, have a read of that scenario, see how you go. Feel free to discuss it in a collegiate sense with each other. Uh, you are allowed to, uh, to, to do that. It's just that you're not allowed to collude. So be aware of that distinction. And then we have the second question, which um, relates to the ability of the Commonwealth to compulsorily acquire land. And the third is in relation to security interests in property law, which is um, something we'll be covering in much more detail fairly soon. So I'll stop the share now and um, please carefully consider that question. Now I mentioned that this week it's all a little different because you're watching this as a recorded session. So just a reminder, on Wednesday evening, seven o'clock, don't expect me to be there, but what I would like you to do is to start acting in a collegiate manner. Now, it may be that you're in the session for 10 minutes, you might be there for an hour, or you may not be in the session at all. It's entirely a matter for you. Don't be concerned that if, for example, you can't make it, that you'll be marked down on, in terms of the lack of attendance for the first assessment purposes, because this second assessment, sorry, this second week is really just for you. It's not particularly for me. So I don't, I'm not gonna mark you down if you're not able to, to attend the session. And the session won't be recorded, so it's just for you. Um, do try to think about how you can contribute. This is not a group assessment situation. It's purely something where I, I'm encouraging you to become more collegiate and um, see what you can contribute. It may be, for example, that you are particularly knowledgeable or interested in one facet of the studies in foundations of property law. So if you are, you might volunteer to um, be one of the leaders of the session in that area. It might be that you collect some thoughts for yourself, put yourself in my shoes for a moment, and you know, think, well, what is it that I could contribute? What's interesting? What have I found? What have I found good? What have I found not so good? Um, what works for me? What doesn't work for me? 
in terms of procedures and content, all of those sorts of things. So I'll be interested to see how you go in terms of that session for this week. Each week, I will try to just supplement that which is in the material with some more general comments. Now you might say, we've got enough to read, we've got enough to cover, why are you doing this to us? Well, the thing is, the thing that struck me about Foundations of Property Law, which is a unit that I hadn't previously taken until this term, is that it's a unit that draws on information from a good number of different sources. Now I've had the privilege of being unit coordinator for Central Queensland or CQ University for some time now, since I think 2012. And um, during that time, I've been the unit coordinator of a wide range of units. And I find myself in preparing for foundations of property law on drawing on information from other units, introduction to law, statutory interpretation, equity, trusts, conveyancing, land law, are some of the ones that immediately come to mind. Because all of those units, which are more specialized in some ways, do provide some of the content to that which is part of the foundation of property law. In other words, you can't really understand property law unless you're able to interpret statutes. You can't really understand property law unless you've got some idea of commercial aspects, which might be co covered in, um, say, commercial law um, units or conveyancing units, perhaps to some degree, or land law. And when it comes to the distinction between common law and equity, we see that often in foundations of property law. So you need to have a good grounding in relation to those things and understand what they mean and how they're applied in a more specific sense. So in that regard, I've been drawing on some of the material that I have from introduction to law and more particularly trusts law. So let's just talk about equity, common law and equity for a moment just as a refresher. So you recall that common law courts imposed rigid rules. Equity and equitable jurisdiction, chancery, introduced a body of legal rules and process that was much more flexible and allowed for a wide range of remedies as opposed to the very restricted remedies available at law, which was primarily damages. Because there was a fusion of law and equity, which is almost entire, but not quite entire, there had to be some way of identifying which would overrule the other in the event of a conflict. And the rule is that in the event of a conflict between a rule of equity and common law, the rule of equity would prevail. And when we talk about the rule of equity, to me, there's the general thinking of, well, how did all this begin? So the historical context is, I think, important when trying to understand and describe what equity is all about. But also the remedies are very important um, to understand and work back from there. And you do need to have some basic idea of equitable principles. So and courts refer to equitable principles. Judges, for example, have a discretion as to whether to grant equitable remedies, such as specific performance or injunctions. So just do have a quick refresher on equitable principles and be prepared to apply that as part of your response to a question on basic property law. So one, for example, pretty common one, one we actually do see in practice is the equitable principle that one who comes into equity must come with clean hands. So it's a purpose of um, the courts to protect the integrity of the court. And what that means is that courts will disapprove of illegal acts. They'll also potentially deny relief for those who have exhibited bad conduct or have trans um, committed a transgression against public policy. So they're not absolute, absolute rules, but they're certainly not encouraged and have, on some occasions actively discouraged. 
And the court may ask whether the bad conduct was just something that occurred or whether it was actually intentional. And um, that will have a bearing on the ultimate decision. Again, looking at it equitably, we're looking at the bigger picture, aren't we? And not just the strict legal rules that was characterised by black letter law of the common law. Another one is that equity looks to the intent rather than to the form. So common law was very rigid. It was very inflexible. And it looked to the very letter of the agreement, didn't worry too much about the intention of the parties in entering into the agreement, but equity does look to the spirit of that which was intended rather than necessarily the letter of the law. So it will consider the intention of the parties and not necessarily rely exactly on the words. But generally speaking, when we're talking about intention, bear in mind the test is an objective test. In other words, what would a reasonable person looking in at what occurred take as being the intention of the parties at that time? So that which the parties say in the witness box as being their intention may or may not be accepted, may or may not be accepted by the court when it comes to resolving a dispute about that. So um, just keep in mind um, how that can apply in property law. Well, for example, a fusion of contract and property law relates to a contract for the sale of land. Very common. Um, generally, in the absence of a clause to say that time is of the essence, which would have been reflected in the common law. You know, it says you must settle by the 10th of February. If you haven't settled on the 10th, even though you're ready on the 11th, common law would deny that person a remedy. Equity is much more flexible. It doesn't rely on that rigid attitude. So equity would generally allow a party a reasonable time in order to complete the transaction. Now, of course, that's a bad example in the sense that for contracts for the sale of land and house in real estate, there is a general provision that says time is of the essence. So even though I'm saying equitable principles need to be considered and the equitable principles will override that which uh, forms the basis of the legal principle, bear in mind that the parties may have had a specific contract provision that for want of a better term, reinstates the black letter um, inflexible attitude of the common law. So <clears throat> when it comes to studying this unit, given that real estate is a large part of the unit, we're really talking about real estate and personal um, property, we're talking about chattels as well. You know, you potentially you could consider things like the REIQ contracts, which are the standard house and land contracts used in Queensland, for example. I'm not providing copies of that in the material. I'm trying to avoid referring to that. Um, as you might expect in conveyancing, we deal with those in a lot of detail. Um, it's very interesting, but I'll try to avoid that specifically. But I'm not going to say to you, if you have some knowledge of what's in the contract or you believe that it may be applicable, then you can add that into your assessment work, um, if you like, as a bonus. And for those of you lucky enough to have access to the Queensland Conveyancing Protocol through the Queensland Law Society, that's a useful resource, as are the resources put out by Lexon. Lexon. Now, speaking of the um, Queensland Law Society, please do consider the excellent Ethics Centre material on the website for the REIQ. Stafford Shepherd and his team have done a wonderful job in putting together these publicly available resources about the ethical requirements of solicitors in Queensland. I mentioned earlier that if you're answering a problem in relation to any legal issue, certainly where I'm involved as the unit coordinator, keep in mind the ethical requirements and a great resource there, REI, sorry, the Queens, uh, Queensland Law Society Ethics Centre. Indeed, what you might want to consider if you haven't already is becoming a member of the Queensland Law Society. 
And you can do that as a student, as a student membership. It just gives you access to information, news, um, and resources that you wouldn't otherwise have. And also, very importantly, it gives you a feeling of belonging. You are a member of the Queensland Law Society. It's a great thing to consider. So if you can't find the um, application for membership, let me know. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I've put it on Moodle anyway. So do keep that in mind. And just as an aside, if you want to become involved um, more in the profession, then look out for community-based legal work. Queensland has uh, some excellent community legal centres. I co-established one of those, the one in Harvey Bay. And um, there are many operating throughout Queensland. They provide free information, free advice, free referrals. And whilst I'm no longer participating as a um, provider of the services, um, many lawyers do give up their time in order to provide that advice free of charge. And certainly when I was providing advice, I agreed to be on the roster on one condition, and that is that law students were always allowed to sit with me. And therefore, almost inevitably, I had you know, five or six students sitting with me while I provided advice. And of course, the, the, the client was given the option of saying, no, I don't want to have students sit in. But it may be that you can find a practitioner who's willing to have you sit in on the advice session, and it's a great way to learn. Now, this week, property law. Some key terms included in your notes. Property. Now, what you would have noticed is that we're talking about personal property and real property. And by and large, I've split this evenly. I'm trying to split it evenly between the two. One is just as important as the other. Real property, of course, describes interests in land. Now, interestingly, leaseholds don't form part of real property theoretically. Uh, they are theoretically personal property. But in practice, um, there's not much of a, a distinction. And um, we, we tend to think about leases, particularly commercial leases that are registered as part of real property. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's more a technical um, distinction. And Remember, of course, that there's land, which is essentially what we mean by real property. But, you know, there is a distinction between um, land and a house and land. Um, and I think the term for the, la the house and the, the area around the house is a messuage. Um, so that's an another distinction. But in the material that you've got to read, the, you'll see that there's some commentary about well, where does the land extend? Does, does it extend below? Does it extend up? And if so, to what extent? Remember, of course, that when it comes to real estate, there are some reservations to the Crown. What I mean by that is that minerals and petroleum rights are reserved to the Crown. So when you own something, when you own real estate, you don't really own it. The closest you'll come is fee simple. Um, but even then, if you look at the deed of grant, which originally created that property, created that fee simple, there are still some reservations to the Crown. You probably think, what's the Crown? The Crown is um, not the government, it's not Parliament, it's not the courts. The Crown is, you know, like the how I describe it as, in the context of a family, it's what we might call the household, is the Crown, as opposed to the individual members, um, you know, mum, dad, and two kids, um, and as opposed to parliament of the household, that might be mum or dad or both of them, might be the kids. Um, but I hope you get that distinction. So crown is more a general term. And then, of course, there are some other distinctions that you need to be aware of in property law, that which is tangible, that which was intangible. We try not to use those terms corporeal and incorporeal um, anymore, but you get the idea. And you will need to know what these things mean, even though you won't probably use them, just in case you come across them in, um, in your um, studies. Uh, you, do, you will need to know chosen action. Chosen action sounds a technical term, and it is, but it's 
important and we still use that term. So um, there are other terms like estoppel, for example, we still use that term very regularly. So chosen action, simply intangible personal rights, for example, debts and shares, but there are different categories. So when you see something about chosen action, I want you to read that and, and understand that carefully. All right, um, one of the problems with foundations of property law is that it's just so broad, there's so much um, that we need to cover. So as I said, don't be overly stressed if you don't read everything in the textbook, or if you do read everything in the textbook, you don't understand every word, that's okay. To some degree, let things flow over the top. I will do my best to try to channel you into those areas that are most important from a practical perspective. So when you're looking at property law and property rights, you need to consider well, what's a property right, what's a property interest, there is a difference. Um, what, and how do those differ from ownership? There's a difference there as well. So you need to consider what type of right are we looking at? Always think about how was that right or that interest created? How is it transferred, which is, alienability, um, how can you, when we talk about alienability, we're talking about the ability to transfer it, to leave it, to sell it, whatever it might be. And then there's the whole area of priorities. Now, priorities is I think now in land law, it used to be as part of this unit, but it became overwhelming. But keep that in mind, where there's a clash of interests, and I shouldn't say it's not part of this unit, it is part of this unit, but there are certain aspects that we're dealing with land law. So if you've got a clash of interest between parties, you've, to some degree, you need to work out who's got the right to the property in question. Um, so what are some of the essential characteristics of property rights? Well, you'll see in the case law that <clears throat> the ability to exclude others is an important characteristic. It's assignability transferability, amiability is important, enforcement of rights is important, and value is important as well. So a good case to look at in general terms is the decision of Stowe, S-T-O-W, against Mineral Holdings Australia. It's a High Court decision from 1977. Citation is 180 CLR 295. That's the authorised citation. I'll try to give you that wherever possible. So in, if you look at that case, you'll see it was to do with a mining licence. It was some um, property in Tasmania. And there was an objector under the Mining Act in Tasmania. We do this a lot in environmental law. So there's another unit that I take that we draw upon for this um, property law subject, or this property law unit, rather. Um, an objector is a person who says, I object to this proposal, which is typically to do with some an environmental based proposal or decision. And um, the decision there spoke about whether a person with a prospectors or exploration license or a miner's right would have an estate or interest in land um, since they had at least some right to occupy and take minerals. and um, in that case, the court held that the, the objectors did not have an estate or interest in land. From a purely environmental law perspective, don't be too concerned about the ultimate decision because the rights of members of the public to object have been expanded considerably since 1977. So it's the point of that case is not to establish the law in relation to who can object and who can't. It was more a case of determining what do we mean by an, an estate or interest in land. And it's just an example. So you'll see that there's a, um, a, a distinction between individual rights and proprietary rights. So in personam versus in rem, and um, keep that in mind. So. Property law is mostly, mostly about rights in REM, R-E-M. What do we mean by that? It's not rapid eye movement, it's, um, it's a single word. So in REM, 
is characterised by the ability to use, uh, to exercise the right against the rest of the world. In personam is essentially a personal right and it's enforceable between particular parties to a contract or a relationship. So there's another categorization that you need to be aware of. Um, equity generally acts in personam, but it has been acknowledged that it goes much broader than, it's much more broad than that in many instances. One thing I would like you to concentrate on in your reading at this stage um, in week two relates to the Commonwealth and its powers to acquire land uh, through compulsory acquisition. Now the Commonwealth does have power to do this. Have a look at the Constitution, Section 51. Of course, Section 51 provides for all the powers of the Commonwealth. And in particular, have a look at subsection Roman 31. So that's XXXI 31. We showed you the little clip from the castle. I'm sure many of you have seen the castle. If you haven't, please do so. Um, and you'll be aware from that movie and your studies in constitutional law, more particularly, that acquisitions by the Commonwealth of land must be on just terms or property must be on just terms, which involves reasonable compensation. So there are a few things that need to be considered there. And that is um, this. So generally at common law, so coming back to common law, landowners were free to exercise their proprietary rights within the boundaries of their own property as they saw fit. So at common law, there was no um, interference from the court, even if they were causing environmental harm or whatever. So a lot of that has changed now. But if there is a statute that somehow restricts the ability of a land landowner to exercise their rights, bear in mind that courts will not interpret the, the statute as meaning that those property rights are modified or removed without clear words. So a preliminary task is to characterise the nature of the entitlement being acquired as property. So if the acquisition of property on just terms uh, means that, well, what, what, what do we mean by property? And you might think it's pretty basic, but it's much more complex and more nuanced than you might think. Um, so when we talk about property, we generally think about something that's permanent something that's secure. Now, to take a contrast, if someone has a license to do something, that usually is not permanent. It usually covers a relatively, you know, it's a time period um, aspect, and it usually is something well short of complete ownership. So is there, for example, an obligation on the Crown to compensate on just terms if someone loses their rights under a license as a result of something that's incorporated in the statute. There is a case that you might want to consider. It's, um, I'm not sure if this is in the text, sorry, but it's in, again, I'm drawing on environmental law here a bit. Environmental Protection Agency against Rashley, R-A-S-H-L-E-I-G-H. The citation is 2005, A-C-T-C-A, so the Court of Appeal of the ACT at 42. Now, in that case, the Court of Appeal reversed an earlier decision by a lower court and established that an owner or lessee of land, while they have a right to access water flowing below that land, does not have property in the water. In other words, a restriction imposed by a regulatory regime in this case through licensing, would not amount to an acquisition even if the license was refused. Now the approach in Rashley has been confirmed by the High Court and the case there is ICM Agriculture against the Commonwealth and the citation is 2009 HCA 51. 
So the general principle is that acquisitions of property are compensable by law. However, if mere restrictions on land use were compensable, it would become a very expensive, probably practically impossible um, policy to implement. And um, it would open the floodgates, so to speak. So providing compensation for restrictions um, is sometimes not possible, but it comes at a cost because it might discourage investment or it might discourage um, people from uh, taking a chance. <clears throat> so sometimes what the governments do as a way around that is they offer statutory schemes of compensation in circumstances where there is no strict obligation under the constitution to compensate under the just terms compensation regime. And so you might see structural adjustment schemes, for example, which provide direct compensation in those circumstances. But um, so even though there may not be that constitutional requirement to pay compensation, there is still the um, a potential of being paid. Now, another case that you might want to consider was um, Spencer against New South Wales, Minister for Climate Change, Environment and Water. The citation 2008, New South Wales Supreme Court, NSWSC 1059. In that case, the plaintiff was offered a structural adjustment scheme. Um, the payment was to purchase his property, which was affected by restrictions on clearance. And <clears throat> It was manifestly unfair on Mr. Spencer that the government had legislated in the way that it did, according to Justice Rothman, but the government um, was able to provide um, some special approach. Mr. Spencer was under a special disadvantage, according to the judge, in that case. And um, the court said, well, all members of society must accept that there will be restrictions on their activities to the greater good of society when those restrictions prevent or prohibit a business activity that would otherwise be legitimate because the area in which they're operating and the assistance provided does not fully compensate the restrictions, society is asking that individual to pay for their benefit. So what can we draw from all of this? It's clear that governments are required to pay just terms compensation when acquiring property. But it's also clear that they're not un, uh, under an obligation to pay just terms compensation when not acquiring property and the failure to provide a license is not regarded as acquiring the property. The loss of value associated with the property is not required, uh, regarded as acquiring a property either uh, for a landholder in general terms. So that's enough of that. In the notes and the material, you would have seen the commentary in relation to the boundary between property and contract. And um, the case there that you'd want to consider is Cowell against the Rose Hill Racecourse Limited, 1936-56 CLR 605. So Cowell paid an entrance fee, entered the racecourse, but was then asked to leave it was suspected that Cal was involved in some illegal betting activities and Cal didn't go peacefully. And Cal was ejected from the race course and then sued the race course for an assault. And their defense was, look, he was a trespasser. It went to the high court, which is quite extraordinary that that would happen. And you see, it was all to do with licenses. And the court, Dixon J said, a license, which was not coupled with an interest is revocable at law. And in the context of property said, the opportunity of witnessing a performance is not an interest in property. It's a tangible, it's not a tangible thing to be taken away from the land. It's more that a personal advantage arising from the presence of, at the place where the license, while unrevoked, authorised the plaintiff to go and remain. Um, and the decision of Latham CJ 
explain the difference between an interest and a license. So it's in your notes and I'll in, encourage you to read that. When it comes to licenses and third parties, read the King, oh sorry, read King against David Allen and Sons bill posting, PT Whale TD. So King owned a cinema, allowed David Allen, the company, to set posters up on the wall and there was a question about whether that was a right that could be continued to be enforced in circumstances where the property was sold. <clears throat> and the matter went all the way to the House of Lords. And the House of Lords categorised the agreement as a licence and said this does not create any interest in land. There was no intention, so we come back to that issue of intention, no intention to confer a property right on David Allen King was liable in damages for breach of contract, but the contract was not strictly enforceable. Now that's interesting for a whole range of reasons. So firstly, it draw, draws upon the difference between a license and maybe a lease. It draws upon whether we have a property interest or not. It also brings in aspects of the common law and equity. And when we talk about the contract not being strictly enforceable, it brings to mind the equitable uh, remedy of specific um, performance. As you can see, one of the themes for tonight is that I want you to have a good understanding of the difference between property rights and property interests, because um, that has a, a bearing on a whole range of things um, that may are fundamental to property law. Property law and um, privacy. The leading case, Victoria Park Racing and Recreation Grounds against Taylor, 1937, 58 CLR 479. So it was a case about nuisance. It was to do with the use and enjoyment of the plaintiff's land. And there was an allegation of unnatural use of the land. And um, the contention was that the plaintiff had made the land suitable for use as a race course and the defendants were deprived to some extent of an ability to use the land for a particular purpose. So again, have a look at the decision of Latham CJ and um, there's a few sort of principles that come from it. Uh, the Chief Justice at the time said, any person is entitled to look over the plaintiff's fence and see what's going on. So no wrong has been done by looking at what's happening on somebody else's land. And that person does no wrong by describing to others, to a wide audience, what's going on. In other words, a spectacle cannot be owned in the ordinary sense. So it really was the introduction of the laws in Australia regarding privacy. They've been modified to some degree. Um, and the, um, uh, Leading case now is probably Australian Broadcasting Commission against Lena Game Meets, PDWL today. And that's a case that I was involved in uh, in equity um, where I was working um, with Alex in that in that unit. All right, so generally speaking, you might recall from that that there's no tort of privacy in Australia, and the authority for that is uh, the ABC and Lena Game Meets. But there are some issues to do with confidence and breach of confidence. Now the next um, general issue is the right to use or enjoy. The leading case there, Yana against Eaton, 1999, 201 CLR 351. And the court in that case determined that the term property does not mean full, exclusive or beneficial ownership. Interesting case, so Yana was an Indigenous man, lived in a remote area of Queensland, police searched the residence and found dead juvenile crocodiles in the freezer. Now that was a contravention of the Fauna Act of Queensland, 1974. Yana said, I've captured these juvenile crocodiles to distribute under customary law. And so the question is whether the Act took away the Act, that is the Fauna Act, took away all of the Indigenous rights that were available under customary law. And the High Court held that 
property should be considered as a bundle of rights rather than merely conferring a right to own it. And ownership is much more complex than one might think at first instance. So I'll go back to an earlier comment that I made at the start saying, look, just be careful about thinking of property as being something that's owned or not owned. It's more accurate conceptually and in reality to think about your rights and your interest and your um, ability to enforce certain things when it comes to, if you like, property rather than ownership. <clears throat> um, so numerous clauses principle, have a look at that. Consider the property rights, rights in personam against rights in rem, as we discussed earlier. Property rights, property law is mostly about rights in rem, which is exercisable against the world, the rest of the world, in personam, enforceable, more to do with contract law in personam. Remember, of course, the Commonwealth Constitution, the importance of that, I've already mentioned section 51, subsection 31. Also consider section 61 and consider section 108 of the constitution. So 108 says that state laws apply in the absence of any exclusive power of the Commonwealth. Section 61 talks about the ability um, of the extension and maintenance of the constitution through the governor general. Have a look at Davis against the Commonwealth. It's 1988 166 CLR 79, where the plaintiffs challenged certain sections of the Australian Bicentennial Authority Act 1980 as unconstitutional, arguing that section 83 of the constitution did not authorize the appropriation of money for the purpose of that authority or the celebration of the bicentenary. So it was, if you like, the part of the counter movement against the bicentenary at that time. Um, do have a look at the decision of Mason, Dean and Gordron in that regard. And um, the court noted that although the statutory regime may be related to a constitutionally legitimate end, the provisions in question reach too far and the extraordinary intrusion into freedom of expression is not reasonable and appropriately adapted to achieve the ends that lie within the limits of the constitutional power. All right, well, that brings us to the end of all I propose to say today. Thank you very much for joining me in Foundations of Property Law. Um, I know there's a lot of material, but we'll get through it. We'll work our way through it. And um, I want you to map out your own plans. Now, the first assessment is really all about you establishing for me, that you've got your act together in terms of you looking at the end objective, how to answer the final exam question or questions. And by the way, there'll be one problem question and two essay style questions in the exam. Um, so you're working towards that and you're starting to collect some notes for yourself in a structured manner. I'm really keen on structure. I like so that if you look at your own document that explains to you foundations of property law, you can identify through the headings and subheadings, maybe flow charts if that works for you, um, where the answer might lie at a fairly quick stage. So that's, that's really part of this first exercise. And that's the sort of thing that I'd hope you'll be discussing together on Wednesday evening this week. So I may not see you on Wednesday evening, but I'll certainly see you the Wednesday after that. All the best. Bye for now.